Good morning, everyone. It is uh, the sixth day of our six day retreat on traveling to the other shore on the Paramitas. It's August 5th, 2022. And today I was going to talk, I am going to talk about um, what is called Sila Paramita or the Paramita of morality or in our specific tradition, the five mindfulness trainings. Um, I, I've been trying to dig for a little bit of history from the standpoint of sutra verification and haven't been able to find that so much, but there are a few stories about, uh, about the Buddha and the idea of, of what were called precepts back then. The idea first was that um, when the Buddha was uh, enlightened, he sat under the Bodhi tree in a, that wonderful evening where he was tempted by Mara, great story. Um, and he went and sort of formed his first Sangha, i.e. the five uh, mendicants that he had been with who were practicing asceticism. Um, there was an idea that, you know, enlightened people don't need precepts, you know, and that kind of how things were. And so I think initially he was resistant to it. He didn't have that kind of thing until he started developing a larger Sangha and perhaps people weren't necessarily as enlightened as, as, as he had expected, or they were on the path to enlightenment. And uh, the one story I think that kind of, after a few things had happened, um, related to alcohol in particular, but one thing that kind of sort of, that I heard it again, apocryphal may not be true, but the legend is that uh, there was a monastic who had a brother who was not a monastic, was a householder, who was having trouble uh, getting his wife pregnant. They, they were, wanted to have a family and they couldn't have it. So uh, he asked his brother if he could try. <laughs> so a lot of monastics would see that as a compassionate act, you know, I mean, so, you know, no, I'm not supposed to be sexual, but I'm helping out my brother here. Um, and the Buddha didn't like that. So he kind of did this. And it's not as if the five precepts that are commonly called were something that the Buddha just made up. They were part of a lot of the spiritual traditions of that part of the world. So he just kind of borrowed them sort of wholesale. And uh, with one exception, with one exception, and, and the big change between what the Buddha did and what was going on before uh, was an absolute prohibition of alcohol, really all psychoactive substances, but alcohol in particular. And I think this is really, again, because he had seen some difficulties in relationship to alcohol consumption among, among the monks. So, so the idea is that um, the five mindfulness trainings or the five precepts are probably not needed if you're fully enlightened, but that's maybe not where everybody is. And so I like to think of them as kind of training wheels on mm -hmm. your path to enlightenment or Maybe you know, um, you know, little little water wings on the sides of your raft to kind of help you uh, stay afloat. And as many people have uh, in America and in the West, uh, I come to the Buddhist tradition from a Christian background, and you know, I I chafe a little bit at rules. I mean, I don't know if anybody else does that. I, I remember the story about, you know, George Carlin, who thought it was, who made a really good point that it was really unfair that if you were, if it was a Friday and you were eating beef jerky and got hit by the bus, you did eternity, you know, you did eternity for eating beef jerky, right? While, while you know, somebody else who slaughtered millions, but had a confession right before death, he was okay. Um, so it was, it was always these kind of rules. And I also had this, kind of contrast as I was exposed to 
the Buddhist path, and many people probably have this as well, is the idea that, ah, there's some noise coming. Um, the idea that everything, everything is expected to be accepted only if you try it out. So, I mean, for example, um, when, when people come to this path and we start talking about, and we try not to do it right away, <laughs> but we start talking about such things as no self. You know, a lot of people have a hard time with no self, and I can understand why. And uh, so we would come in and we would, you know, tell people to just sort of sit with it and not worry about whether you could kind of accept it or not. And any of the, any of the concepts of Buddhism. Um, one, of, one of my favorite stories, I mean, and, and Ty was very accepting of this. Um, I believe this is true because I talked to the actual monastic who this happened to. Uh, at the time I talked to him, he was about 30. And he had, when he was about 23, 24, just learning. And I think he was kind of like, he thought he was really very full of energy and things. And he came along to, uh, had an interview with Ty and said, uh, Ty, I, I very much respect your teachings, but I think there's no self thing. I think that's all wrong. <laughs> you imagine someone going to Thich Nhat Hanh and saying that. And quite, and he said, and Thich Nhat Hanh was incredibly equanimous about it. He didn't try to talk him out of it. He didn't give him a special sutra to read or anything else. He had tea with him and that was that. And after he had diligently practiced for a couple of years, he saw that kind of, how that philosophy sort of fits in. So there was this kind of conflict for me when I was starting out and maybe for some of you too, which is kind of, believe what you need to believe, kind of go and see what part of the Dharma you can take in. Oh, but by the way, there are these five things and you got to, you got to adhere to them. Um, and that chafes a little bit. Now, also part of that, however, though, and Thai has made it very, very clear that no one can do the five mindfulness trainings perfectly. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a little bit of kind of an idea that they are a kind of a North star to go to. And when I actually, after, especially after they've been kind of rewritten, I find very little in the five mindfulness trainings that I can really disagree with. As a matter of fact, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. So I realized a lot of my resistance was just the fact that I had had this upbringing about people giving me rules that I didn't necessarily like, and they were called these spiritual things, and they were supposed to be extraordinarily important. And, you know, these are, you know, they, I, I'm, I'm really low on the totem pole at Plum Village. Uh, people don't know who I am and anything else, but when they were coming up with the idea of changing them from precepts to something else, uh, there's something about the word precept that annoys Europeans. And I, I don't know exactly why, but there might be something in that. But people who are practicing in Europe are saying, we just don't like this. So they're going to change it to something else. I suggested the five good ideas. <laughs> no one ever listened to me in that. They called them now since about, since, since 1993, they've been called the five mindfulness trainings. And when I was first exposed to them in 1993, they were already on their second version. The first version had all those do nots. So the first version was do not kill, do not let others kill, do not accept any killing in your thinking or way of action. Um, and now most of the mindfulness trainings start, you know, aware of the suffering caused by. Um, they were revised in 2009 when um, Ty had a, and this was happening every June, there was a three week retreat in English and uh, attracted a lot of people and both uh, people, order of interbeing people, monastics, but anyway, just anybody who had actually taken the five mindfulness trainings could be part of, part of this committee. And I guess that was part of the thing that happened during that particular retreat is they got together and rewrote them. And that's sort of the, the, the way that we do it now. Um, we've done one little tweak on our own. We've made them from I statements to we statements, but other than that, they're the same way they always have been. And the other thing that is uh, a little bit maybe, I mean, maybe alarming, maybe not, 
is that Plum Village has always been a moving target. Things are always changing from how you write whatever. Um, and the, uh, the, the, there was an expectation, I think, that maybe around every 10 years, and that would have been 2019, that the mindfulness trainings would be rewritten to reflect the times. Um, and as, as Ty lost his ability to speak and his ability to lead in that way, it kind of went by the way. And I'm not sure when or how they will ever be entirely revised. I am, however, uh, enheartened a little bit by the fact that the third mindfulness training was rewritten this spring. It wasn't like really gigantically major changes, but it really was rewritten. So these are reflections and they go way beyond the uh, original five precepts. Uh, depending on what tradition you're in, there's either five, eight, or 10. Um, I think my favorite one is number eight, if you're doing the eight and, and we don't do that, which is uh, don't sleep on a high bed. <laughs> I think it was about putting on airs and that was their way of saying don't put on airs. But I guess if you slept on a high bed, you were you know kind of a, a, a higher class person than if you just slept on the floor. And that was actually a precept. And actually, I think it still is a precept that goes on with that. And uh, for people who are with the monastics, back in the Buddha's time, after he was hesitant about, about precepts, about mindfulness trainings, started piling them on. And um, by, the time he, uh, by the time he died, there were something on the order of about 240 precepts. Um, but actually, the, and that was for men, and there were 400 for women. I know, I know. <laughs> um, and the Plum Village monastics still have 200 and some odd precepts, and they get together and kind of, they do get together and kind of talk about them. And I don't know if they ever recite all 240 all at once, but there is that kind of thing. But the idea, again, is that they are just guiding things only. They're good ideas. And like everything else, you kind of take it as, as what it is. So instead of actually, we, we're gonna recite these later this morning. And this is something that we do as part of the Plum Village tradition. Uh, there are many people in the room who have officially taken them on. As you know, if you take them on as a, uh, as a practice, you get a, a Dharma name and you're expected to recite them at least once every three months. Um, I got a really cool Dharma name, Healing Touch of the Heart, back in 1995. I really like that. <laughs> um, actually, it's, those are really called lineage names. The Dharma names are when you go to the order of Richard lineage names. And uh, so uh, I thought, I, as, as I often do when we recite the five mindfulness trainings, there's something that kicks and sticks out for me when I read them. And it's almost as if I never saw that part before. Other people have had that experience, I think. You know, you read them and, and they are, you know, they're, uh, you know, two sides of a piece of paper there. They're fairly wordy. Um, but getting back to the original variations, the original very short versions of these, and actually they're kind of all now, it's still the same thing is, do not kill, do not steal, um, don't be sexual uh, for the monks and, and be sexually responsible, responsible uh, for, uh, for lay people. Do not lie and do not use intoxicants. That's kind of the whole thing like that. So the five mindfulness trainings have always been an expansion of that. And so I thought I'd just go through the five things that I thought that struck out to me, one in each training as, as I was reading them uh, last week and just, just, just preparing for this. So under reverence for life, the, the, the last sentence on that was is that seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, we will cultivate openness and discrimination and a non-attachment to views in order to transform violence, fanaticism, and dogmatism in ourselves and in the world. And so this is a path. This is the path that we've really been talking about when we talk about the, uh, the paramita of wisdom and the paramita of dana, of generosity. 
the idea that we don't kind of wrestle our mind to say, boy, really like that bratwurst, but I'm not going to have it, is the idea that you are, um, you, you're actually changing your consciousness so that the idea of killing becomes less and less of a problem. And the more we work towards this, the easier it should be able to get. It's an interesting thing. And this is something that Ty has always thought was gradual. And I want to contrast this to the, the fifth mindfulness training when we get to it. The, uh, if you ask people, and so in, in implicit in that, without ever being really stated, is that people who are uh, on this path are vegetarian. Uh, if you ask people in Vietnam, uh, or if, if, if people are asked in Vietnam if they're vegetarian, they're also asked another question, which it sounds really peculiar, which is how many days. So in, in Vietnam, people kind of do this on a gradual process. They're vegetarian for three days a week or five days a week or seven days a month, or then they do that gradually and that kind of a thing. So it's kind of peculiar. But, you know, most Americans, we kind of just take it right on if we kind of need to. But this idea about, you know, I, I, I just kind of want to get this, uh, I need to get this kind of into the talk somewhere. <laughs> and this is a good place. How, how we become, have this reverence for life is we do these other practices. So I wanted to share this particular phrase. And I talked, I don't know if I talked in a, in a regular Dharma talk about this or whether I was talking in a group that Thomas Merton, I found out it was Louisville where Thomas Merton had his enlightenment experience. And there's a plaque right there in Louisville, Kentucky of all places, you know, where Mitch McConnell's from. Uh, they actually have a plaque towards someone's enlightenment experience. Then it was as if suddenly, I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts, where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach the core of the reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes. If only they can see themselves as they really are, if only we could see each other that way all the time, there would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. Good problem to have, I think. And, and so the idea about, you know, of course, you, you try to have that part of your conscious mind that's disciplined to say, you know. Now, the other part about this that is really interesting is a kind of a hierarchy of morality. And one of the hierarchies of morality in a lot of the monastic traditions is you never refuse a gift. And so when the monastics then and now, some monastics still do this, but mostly they do it, mostly they do, they get money and buy food. But in the monastics, in the Buddha's time, their first thing in the morning, they'd get out wherever close to the villages and they would take their begging bowls and they would get their food and that's how they would get their food. And the um, idea is that, you know, you accept whatever is given to you. And most people in that time knew that the, um, that the Buddhist monks didn't want to eat meat and they would stay away from that. But if someone threw a slab of meat in there, if they threw your bratwurst in there, you're expected to kind of, to kind of do that. And I know that somebody who had um, monastics over to their house for Thanksgiving, you know, were surprised that the monastics were eating turkey. And they, that's because that was what was offered to them. So offer, refusing a gift is a bigger moral offense than eating meat at least in that kind of sense. This leads to the uh, another uh, kind of apocryphal, no one really knows if this is true, but it, the sutras kind of support this, is that the Buddha died by eating spoiled pork. That someone in his begging bowl had thrown some pork in it, didn't look very good, but the Buddha never refused anything. And he thought it was enough edible and he was frail anyway, and it wasn't as if he was going to live another 10 years. But apparently that was his kind of end event was actually eating uh, spoiled meat. So an interesting little side story about that. Under the second mindfulness training, which is traditionally do not steal. Um, this, this is one of the, the, 
the, the best phrases that I, I love to see in the um, Plum Village tradition. Uh, and of course, the this mindfulness training is all about how we deal with things. All those little things in our lives, riding the hedonic treadmill, all that stuff. We are aware that happiness depends on our mental attitude and not on external conditions, and that we can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that we already have more than enough conditions to be happy. Wow. And, you know, he, he talks about how the monks just had a couple of robes and a bowl, and that was it. And they living simply and that sort of thing. We do know, however, that and and the idea that you know trying to find happiness through material um, material means is uh, is fraught with all kinds of difficulty. And yet, I think I could be wrong about this, but it was somebody around somebody who was writing about a hundred years ago. I think it was John Dos Passos who who coined the phrase of uh, the American dream, uh, which was spiritual fulfillment through material gain. And that this has been a lot of America. And, you know, this is Bill Clinton campaigning for president with a big sign that says it's the economy, stupid. The idea that we can kind of do this and in this particular training and say, no, it's not what you have. It's what your own particular viewpoint is. You already have enough. You will not be happier by having that extra car. You will not be happier by having that as, as an overall goal. You won't be happier by having the, uh, uh, the big addition on your house. You know, it's all just related to what you're doing inside and relationships and that sort of thing. So I really, and the, the second mindfulness training I think is really challenging for a lot of us. Um, the third one, which was originally uh, do not for monastics have no have no sexual contact, and for monastic and for people who were not monastics to be responsible, is one that has been rewritten, and it's really wonderful to see that. Um, it's interesting. So I want to make this contrast. We did something that I don't know if we're naughty or not, but we decided that we were going to take all of the I statements and make them into we statements. Mm -hmm. However, in the original, before we did that, there is actually one we statement, and that's what practicing true love, we know that we will continue beautifully into the future. And, uh, and they also talk about cultivating the four basic elements of true love, love and kindness, compassion, joy, and exclusive, for the greater happiness of ourselves and the greater happiness of others. So other, other than obviously having the idea about sexual responsibility and it's a big thing for people. Uh, I like the idea that it has this inclusiveness of other kinds of, of love. Um, quite frankly, for the monastics, it's one of the bigger deals. Um, the the, the um, number one reason that monastics leave the Plum Village tradition, and some of them do, is uh, to start a family. And, you know, they, it, at least is something about that kind of a, of a sexual thing. So, um, you know, my, I wish I'm, I'm now going to block on what her name is, but for many of us for years from about maybe 1995 to about 2010, there was this tall monastic who had this really beautiful voice. And on a lot of the CDs at that time, if you're looking and you hear this single voice, this single male voice, that's Brother Michael. And uh, Brother Michael and his then girlfriend, about age 20, uh, joined the monastic community around 1995. And they, you know, that's what they did. And somewhere, I think maybe the idea about biological clocks ticking and do they really want to do this, they left about 15 years later. Uh, but anyway, that's as an aside, but that's that's the kind of thing that, you know, we, and, you know, Ty has, has also said, I mean, not Ty, other people have said the kind of only thing that really people have been kind of quote unquote booted out or not maybe the only one, but the, the, the highest thing for getting people booted out 
of the monastic community is inappropriate sexual energy. So it's a, it's a, it's a big one for the monastics. Of course, for us, you know, just the idea that we need to be responsible and loving with all of that. Uh, in the fourth mindfulness training, there are, uh, there are two parts that I thought were really good. Knowing that words can create happiness or suffering, we are committed to speaking truthfully using words that inspire confidence, joy, and hope. Oh, I'm sorry. The original part of this training was do not lie. We are determined not to spread news that we do not know to be certain and not to utter words that can cause division or discord. Well, when they wrote, we are not determined not to spread news that we do not know to be certain, there was no clickbait. And it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. I, If you haven't seen that where people will tell you the latest thing they saw on the internet. And a lot of times it's just either not true or just a rumor, but you wanna be the first person to say it. You wanna be the first person to tell your friends about it and kind of go with that sort of thing. Um, so not spreading news that we do not know to be certain can be a real problem, especially if we have people in our tribe who are spreading news that they're pretty sure is certain. And we need to kind of kind of work with that a little bit. The other part, like I said, knowing that words can create uh, uh, happiness or suffering is the idea of watering seeds in other people. I think that's a really deep practice. I think it's a really deep practice to water seeds in other people. And uh, I, I really enjoy the idea that um, uh, the, the people in Arise were talking about on Tuesday night not necessarily with words, but having the, uh, well, maybe a communication, having a smile, watering a positive seed in somebody is going to be that way. Uh, in, in some of the regular daily chants of the Plum Village tradition, and many people know this one, is the idea of easing the pain of suffering of somebody in the morning and, off morning and offering joy to someone in the afternoon. Uh, but that offering of joy is, I think, a really important part. Um, and the fifth mindfulness training, which says, do not take intoxicants. Um, now, this was interesting because in the Buddha's time, that wasn't, that wasn't exactly it. It was something like, don't overdo it, but it's okay to use it. And uh, quite frankly, this is the kind of thing that a lot of people chafe at. Ty was very clear, it was zero out. And you would, people would come up to him and say, but you know, I, I, I go to this wedding and you know, the people are doing champagne toast. No, uh, you know, we, we have this kind of Seder that we do and there's some wine drinking as part of it. He would just say no. And he says that he himself had talked to many religious leaders and didn't find anybody that says, no, you could just substitute some kind of a fruit juice if you had to for those particular times when alcohol was being consumed. And so he, you know, as compared to the first mindfulness training, which is essentially saying, don't eat meat. It was like, well, you know, work towards it. And the fifth mindfulness training was the idea that, um, you know, you, you had to stop dead in your tracks, no more alcohol. And that, that's a real, pro I mean, I found that really to be difficult when we, uh, back in those days, uh, I was a person, when I went on retreats, I wore my brown jacket, which identified me as kind of a guy that you're supposed to come for attention. And then when they talk about the five mindfulness trainings, I would get people coming up to me and say, I want to talk about the five mindfulness trainings. And they'd say, you know, I can't do this alcohol. It's just part of our tradition. We're not alcoholics, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'd say, yeah. And the other thing about Thai's tradition, which is not true in all traditions, is you don't have to take all five trainings. So many people have just taken the four without taking the fifth because the alcohol is part of their culture. Uh, when I was first kind of exposed to the mindfulness trainings in 1993, I had this habit of, uh, of coming home after you know my crazy day doing pediatrics uh, some crazier than others. And uh, I would just have a, a single beer, you know, before dinner. It was Moosehead. 
moose headlock. And probably, and I realized one of the reasons that I like doing it is that my daughter, then five, thought that was the most hilarious thing in the world. She was, I'd say, well, I'm going to have a moose head. Moose head, and she just laughed forever. <laughs> and I realized a lot of my thing we were having my beer was getting my daughter to laugh about it. I mean, she never, she never thought it wasn't unfunny. If, you know, so I, I had finally did it. The reason I gave it up also is, also is so I, I don't specifically have an alcoholic addiction. But someone said this, he said, well, is there someone in your family who has an alcoholic problem or another substance abuse problem? And I said, well, yeah. And they said, you really ask people, everybody's got somebody in the family. If you're not a substance abuse user, that substance abuser, that's true, but everybody's got somebody. And, my, and, and the feeling that was given to me was, if I'm going to ask this person in my family because it's hard for them and they've got this addiction, you know, they've got their little nucleus accumbens in their brain yelling at them all the time to drink. And I don't have that. And I can't give it up. I'm expecting this person to give it up. I understand that a little bit better. So, um, the, so I, so I, you know, when I took the mindfulness trainings in 95, uh, I, I did give up alcohol. I, I, I will say that I probably have about a beer a year just at various odd times when it just seems to be that way, but I, otherwise I don't. But the other very interesting thing to me that I didn't notice when I was having my moose head every day was that I would notice, I notice now. So if I, I haven't had a beer now in over a year right now, if I drink a beer, I will be affected for 24 hours. I will just be a little bit off. I never noticed it before, but I just be a little, not, not a lot, but I just kind of be mindful. Yeah, I'm not quite as sharp. Something's a little bit off. Good time for Jane to get me to play chess. So anyway, Jane and I play chess all the time. So just so people don't know, and she's, I, sometimes I needed advantage because she beats me more than I beat her. But anyway, <laughs> um, so at any rate, that's, that's one of those kinds of things to, to sort of think about and is, is, your particular use of alcohol, if it's not a problem for you, why can't you give it up when it is a particular problem for people that you know and love? So as an example, as a means of solidarity, if you can kind of look at that as a kind of, kind of going that thing. However, that's not the phrase in the uh, particular training that's called nourishment and healing. This is the phrase that Ty put in. We are determined not to gamble or to use alcohol, drugs, or any other products which contain toxins, such as, and the Buddha never had to worry about this, certain websites, electronic games, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. Wow, that's a lot in there. And, um, I used to think about that and I would, one of the things, and I would go on retreats all the time and talk about this to people until I, I got a little bit of insight. I'm, I'm a little thick myself, but sometimes takes a couple of years to go in there. What's a toxic conversation? I mean, if I'm being mindful, what's a toxic conversation? I mean, why, I, I can just, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be dragged into that emotion. I'm not going to go that way. I'm being mindful. I'm paying attention, except I wasn't except I really would get into these conversations, usually political, that would end up being toxic for me because my mind's not getting changed, their mind's not getting changed, and we're just being, we're just like friction at each other. Yeah, there are toxic conversations. And Ty would absolutely say, walk away from those. It's not being rude. It's not being, you may bow very politely and say, um, uh, I'm sorry, I would like to just not have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And hopefully people would kind of adjust to that. Uh, websites and all these other sorts of things, really interesting how that is. We all have a feeling and the debates go on. And of course, no one, nothing is certain with all of this about how much social media is a problem. But we do know there's toxic social media. And we do know that it is, it is doing a lot of bad things to the country and the world. And to kind of go with them. So um, maybe today, when we recite the five mindfulness trainings, those of you who have heard it before, you'll probably hear something that you didn't 
you know, you, you, you know I, I must have read these five mindfulness trainings since 2009. Gosh, maybe, uh, you know, several hundred times. And, you know, sometimes I read them and I say, did they sneak that one in? I don't remember hearing them say that one. And, it, it, and it's a wonderful, like I say, they're just wonderfully good ideas. And as I say right now, I can't disagree with any of them. And I do need sometimes to sit up and do that. Um, I did have that kind of a little bit of that problem about being a joiner with this, you know, I mean, some people have that. Uh, and in 1995, while I was on retreat and I had been on my own, I, my first retreat with Ty was in 1993. And then in 1995, I was on retreat with Ty again. And in 93, when offered the idea to take the mindfulness trainings, I declined for a lot of reasons. And then, in, but I said, you know, let's try this out. And so in uh, 1993 on, I uh, decided to take them on as a training. Um, although, you know, I'm, I'm sure I messed up here and there. Um, and um, by 95, I kind of actually really took them. My feeling about it was, you know, I even, even right up to the moment just before, I was like, do I really need to do this? I'm already following the trainings. I mean, why do I need to get a cool Dharma name? I can get myself a cool Dharma name. So. Um, and, but it really made a difference. And it really made a difference in the fact that I was there with, you know, a couple of hundred other people. There were a thousand people at this retreat. There were a couple of hundred people, maybe, maybe I think it may be 150, 200. They were taking the five mindfulness trainings for the first time at that retreat. And it was very, very empowering to kind of do this with people. We did this in the pandemic. We did this online with our wonderful Dharma teacher, Trish Thompson. And I thought it was just a, a tremendously moving thing, even though she was in Vietnam at the time and we were scattered in various places in Wisconsin and Illinois, it was really terrific. So there's something about that kind of getting together and saying in unison, yes, this is part of my path, sila paramita, one of the rafts that takes us to the other shore. Everybody's got their own little path. Everybody has their own morality. And I, I, I'm absolutely not going to say, boy, you really should take the five mindfulness trainings because I don't know that you should. And I certainly, I certainly chafe at the idea that often happens where people have been studying Buddhism for a week. <laughs> I mean, I get these, I get these emails from people. It's really cool. Oh boy, I've, I've been looking at this. I started reading, I don't know, Alan Watts or something. I want to become a Buddhist. I want to, I want to take the precepts. And, you know, they, you know, two weeks ago, they didn't even know, you know, they didn't know precepts from, you know, a Pontiac. And, you know, the, the, I think you need to kind of, I think you do. I, I like my method of kind of letting them seep in for a couple of years before deciding to do it. But you might just look at it. And you might just look at them and say, yeah, that's kind of an interesting way to, to kind of be. Maybe we can be that way and see how that all goes. So anyway, thank you all for your time today. And we have plenty of time for questions or comments if there's anything that people would like to share about that. Larry, could you come up forward to our little microphone? Oh, I'm going to, all right, for, sorry, I'm going to unpin me. Yeah. I uh, took the mind of trainings, uh, as Paul was mentioning, with, with Trish uh, by Zoom, and it really was a wonderful experience. At first, I thought I wanted to do it in person. It actually turned out to be actually useful. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I like what Paul has said about the, the, the drinking one, because that was a southern block for me. I knew about the high management training for like 10 or 15 years, and I said, well, I'm not going to get it. And then as a former drug and alcohol minister, um, I said, well, Buddha say, what is the Dalai Lama said, if you get any knowledge, you can, you can change things. And, you know, we know that the drug alcohol level is terrible. Alcohol level of 0.04 or less is not really compromising your judgment. So I kept saying to myself, 
the Buddhists are wrong, you know, and they didn't win. <laughs> well, obviously, that wasn't getting it anywhere. So I decided to go ahead. And what I want to point out, Paul, is that it isn't often mentioned, and I forget the exact words. What are the words I pledge to or I vow to understand, practice? What is that? when you say you're taking the vows. Oh, those are the three refuge vows, right? Right. Yeah. I, I vow, oh, I vow the, the, well, the two children's promises. I vow to develop understanding in order to live peacefully with people, under, people, animals, plants, and minerals. And I vow to develop my compassion, understanding and compassion. The, the, the children have two vows, to the two vows, yes. But, but it's actually, when you, when you do the, the, the ceremony, there's, a, you're not pledging like, your life, it's more like I pledge to try to understand yeah. and to practice. Right. And you don't have to be perfect. So I thought, well, I can pledge that part. And the thing that I learned from that, um, and this is yeah, I kind of guess the point, we call this the five mindfulness training, but we talk about it as a morality training almost. When I gave up the, the drinking and I decided to do it for several months, um, that allowed me to be more mindful. And so all the times that I would like, like with Paul, I would have the sort of dream, you know, if I'm drilling out, then you know, I would have my gear while I'm drilling and uh, some other things. I, it helped me with the mindfulness part to notice what was actually going on in my head um, in one of these dreams. Uh, it just became a, a sort of an autopilot. Um, so whether or not I dream in the future, I think it, at least now, I will drink mindfully. In my view, that's probably uh, enough reason to try this. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. What's your lineage name? Compassion and guidance of the heart. Um, I do want to mention for people who have children or are interested in that, there are those two children's promises. They're very short. I vow to develop understanding in order to live peacefully with people, animals, plants, and minerals. And I vow to develop compassion in order to live, so it's understanding and compassion. Um, I don't know why. So usually there's children at these retreats that tie us on and they get their little trainings and their certificate. And uh, we were, I don't know why, why one time they decided, maybe because there were only like five or six kids doing it, they were reading their Dharma names. And their Dharma names were like, leaping, beautiful dolphin of the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Fluttering, iridescent butterfly of the heart. <laughs> and all the adults you were in the audience were saying, why don't we get Dharma names like that? <laughs> so at any rate. Any other comments or questions? Is it all either self-explanatory or I put you to sleep, I can't tell which. Oh, Greg, thanks. Uh, I'm not planning to take the mindfulness vows, but but I'm very much committed to the finding that path. Um, but when I'm, I'm happy to hear Paul speak to this, or anyone kind of speak to me about it later, uh, it always struck me that the original precepts were for the don't lie, don't steal, don't steal. They kind of like never do these things. They're kind of absolutist. While the Buddha claimed um, that it's not a life of self indulgence first, kind of like the self denial, and then it shows the middle path. So I'm wondering, uh, I'm curious to explore the question of the phrase that the Buddha would use this thing. But uh, a conversation around. Uh, um, how do we apply the physical world that we have to what we need to do? Okay. Cherie. Um, I wanted to share that I'm sitting across the table. 
There's an also, like, I always do it because um, I was really stressed, even though every time we do that, oh, yes, 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 like, I love it like this, but being a recovering professionist, I feel like if I couldn't commit to doing it perfectly, I felt like I could do it. And so I had a really, really hard time uh, making that choice uh, through the fear of failure. Um, and it was really, really helpful Paul talking about um, it being kind of a guide for a, I love the idea of the five different years. I love that. Um, and a guide long term. So rather than <laughs> screaming, um, I bought all sorts of things. And part of our just going to make like a policy on wine. I can feel like the person out of the wine. Um, talking about me and the beginning, that was crap. So I felt like they needed me. And I don't know if I can do it. And I'm like, all these things in the end, I just don't know. Like, it's like I'm more sure that I'm going to fail. And I'm sure that I can succeed at them. So I really didn't want to do that. I took them away, and it was really powerful. You know, I was, you know, on the field with my bedroom at all here, and I didn't know what to do. My work was off. And after that experience, it was really interesting. What I felt is I almost felt like I had. Spiritual friend with me sometimes, like I kind of like sat down and ordered, or alcohol was an option. I definitely didn't always say no, I'm not doing it, but it made me more mindful. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's kind of like me today, but it made me more mindful of the choice that was made. <laughs> and so I don't think for me, they're incredibly great ideas, but I definitely want to live by as much as I can. But I also didn't want to disconnect myself from them just because I didn't think it would work. So, and I think by doing that, it actually gave me strength rather than. Thank you, Shuri. What's your name? Oh, oh, that is really good. Deep connection of the heart. Connection of the heart. Brianna? This is an interesting quote. This is the thing. I can't exactly remember who it's by. Um, but the road of access leads to the palace of wisdom. For if you don't know what's too much, you'll never know what's enough. Yeah. And I'd also like to say, um, I'd love to give up meat and alcohol, um, but there's like some little part of my brain that's like, these are such joys of life. <laughs> like, why would you have to miss out on these little joys of living? That's like hard for me. Thanks, Brianna. Well, what we all know, uh, as as Greg was mentioning here, we all know that was the Buddha's path. Was the Buddha had a tremendous amount of excess? I mean, from the standpoint he lived the wealthiest life, he was you know like the the Bill Gates of of the of the uh, the Nepal border. There, uh, he had everything he wanted. He had three palaces: one for spring, one for summer, one for winter, one for the rainy season. 
um, he, he eventually said no sex, but he had all the sex he wanted. He, he, he had definitely multiple partners just because he was a prince, he could have concubines and he, he did. And, you know, he could throw parties whenever he wanted to and all those other sorts of things. So I would imagine that a great deal of the Buddha's early life, although it never put into this term, was debauchery. And, and then he spent six, six years. Well, he says, well, that didn't work. So like most of us, he overreacted. Um, <laughs> and he went the other way. He went and did this kind of thing where he had asceticism for six years where he apparently, I mean, you'll see these statues of all that sort of thing. And he basically, you know, uh, and actually after he got to be enlightened, the people who were the six, the other five ascetics he was practicing with, they turned their back on him when they saw him coming. They said, uh-oh, Gautam, you know, Gautama screwed up. He didn't play the game out till the end. You know, enlightenment is not his until he talked to them. And apparently that his, just his, the way he was, made them clear that that was how it is. Um, and absolutely, we get a lot of people who come to the Buddhist path after excess. You know, there's really no doubt about it. And the kinds of things that go on with that. Uh, we, like many groups our size, have a 12-step program in our, in our place. I mean, it's not a 12-step, it's the 11th step. Meets every Sunday night, mostly on, it's just meeting online right now, but it's been going on now for 10 years. And so we, you know, there's just a lot of the people who this really hits home for who had those kinds of excesses. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Priyani. You know, just, I, I think the idea of just being in the practice, it'll, it'll, it'll either happen or it won't happen. Very good practitioner in our practice, a very good one that had been in the mindfulness community and has been in the mindfulness community for 20 years. About Six or seven years ago, I know it was pre-pandemic, he said, uh, I'm going to take the mindfulness trainings. And I said, you haven't already taken them? I was really surprised. And he had, it was just like he needed to have that kind of percolate to decide which or not. Plus, you know, they, you don't need six rafts to get to the other shore. If the mindfulness trainings are not something that you think is a skillful means for you, you don't have to do it. You don't have to use it. So. Colleen. I'm curious what Ty would do if someone put a little bit of wine in his bowl. Yeah. Don't know. <laughs> I mean, I honestly don't know in Ty's particular situation, but people, like I say, people who are um, Plum, Village, Plum Village monastics have eaten meat when they've been visiting friends and that's been part of the celebration, like I say, Thanksgiving dinner, that's happened. So I don't really know. I mean, maybe he would, maybe wouldn't. I couldn't couldn't really say. I mean, you could kind of see how he could go morally either way. So just why somebody was, I think Jane was talking about somebody that was like, you know, in, in a culture where it's absolutely a, a complete insult to refuse anything we're getting fish served with the eye that you actually need to eat the eye it's like oh. if you didn't eat the eye it was a big insult oh wow yeah <laughs> yes somebody over here jim thanks uh yes uh jim if it's sort of off on a personal experience with the last person uh and like others have said like i i had my little alcohol habit at the end of a work day, uh, especially in the summer, I would just love to pour myself a delicious dinner in time and just savor it and enjoy it and get a mild buzz and move on. <clears throat> now, it's a long time yoga for that practitioner. Many of my yogi friends would be like, what, I'm drinking alcohol? And they just really kind of reject me into that. <clears throat> and uh, of course, you know, last year, Coming to the retreat, I didn't drink any alcohol. That seemed to be contrary to what we were doing. <clears throat> it's fine. Go home and a couple of weeks later, I poured myself a bit of content, took a sip, and I was like, meh, you know, and I just poured it out. And to me, that and I haven't, you know, the only drink I've had since then is I made a really sumptuous holiday meal that just demanded 
Assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. And, uh, but that's it. And it's not like it's been a struggle or anything. It wasn't even a decision. It was just something that rose up. And to me, that's how I would view these things. Because I'm all about letting these things rise up. I suppose they have to move totally down. So that was my experience. And, and you know, I took great value from the experience that I contributed to the uh, condition of the uh, song of the last year. Thank you all for that. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for sharing that. Charlie? How should we define gifts that we can't accept? Uh, with kindness, you know, honoring, I think you honor the person and says, thank you for that. Uh, but and and explain for whatever reason that you can't accept that so you know and just kind of go with that but always with kindness and always with an idea that you appreciate their gesture that you appreciate that they have they are wanting to give you something that they feel is of value but that you don't um and and that's the best way to do it as kindly as possible i do realize that sometimes that's not going to come out so good no matter what and the, the people who wouldn't eat the eyeball, while we were really at there, there was no excuse for that. It was, you know, what are you not going to eat the eyeball? Um, and, uh, and, and, but you do the best you can and be, always be as kind as you can in those kinds of refusals. So. Anyone else? I will also say as, um, the the i the idea of eating beef for me now is about as appetizing as eating sand. I mean, there's something about it. Uh, you know, I, I I could eat I can and occasionally we do things like fish, but I've I've not really had any real kind of beef for a really long time, and it just doesn't appeal to me. It's just really you know, and I I used to be one of those kind of drop off at McDonald's for a quarter pounder type people. Yeah, even being a pediatrician, uh-oh. <laughs> Just hoping I wouldn't run into any of my patients there. Uh, and yeah, it, it eventually, you know, so a lot of our conditioning about doing things like eating meat and drinking alcohol or habit energy, you know, it's habit energy. There's something pushing you along. And again, uh, I think this is not a surprise for people, especially people who have been through 12-step programs, that, it, that your environment, is one of those things that makes you have certain habits, which is why a lot of people, you know, we, we have this situation, uh, I, I go to the prisons and they're, they're talking about it all the time and uh, is, you know, whatever you do, don't go back to your former life. You will go back to your former life and you will, and you will, you know, you will reoffend. And people say, oh, no, I'm not. I'm so changed. I've been, you know, I've been doing my Buddhist practice in here and I, I'm determined and everything else. And yeah, I mean, it's sad for me to see guys who were in my group and then didn't see them. Oh, you know, probably. Got, and then two years later, they, they're back in my group. And a lot of it's just because they went back to that. So noticing that kind of habit energies, I think that's a little bit about the, in that list there of things where they're talking about all these toxic things, websites, electronic games, TV programs, I think they could throw in toxic environments and that, you know, we should maybe avoid those as well, so. Jonathan. I just had a question for Paul. Do you think anyone would be interested in, in talking or hearing about the experience Taking the mindfulness training and how it makes your practice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you talk for just a moment? Yeah. And we're running, I think we're running up on a little bit of, of time pressure here, but yeah. I can, I can be brief. You can be brief. <laughs> and we'd like to give Jonathan an at time. To... One of the difficulties in looking at the mindfulness training is first. And if you look at the old Buddhist precepts, they they have a kind of absolute joke about it. But if you look at the mindfulness experience, 
In fact, they take into account the complex causes and conditions of a lot of life in the West. It's a very modernized set of understandings of the the moral traffic in your life. If you look at it closely, you'll find that, at least in my own experience, it doesn't collide with the religious teachings of any other tradition. That is, if you have an American religion, Thich has always been extremely open to your maintaining that American religion. Well, you got to the practice that comes with my own experience. But I will many people in the, the face of taking the mind of experience by the first year I am not good at it. And the other I have a little bit. <laughs> and that's probably true. But the first thing of mindful experience, the first of the application of character, is you really do review them every month to see if you can have guys to develop your life in accordance with the wisdom that's there. It doesn't ask you, you know, to bow if you've been perfect. It asks you to bow if you've tried. And the taking of the my own experience is not your affirmation that you need to do it advance. It's your affirmation that you need to be put into the stream. And stream enter is a very old term in yoga. And it typically applies, and I may not have used it quite correctly, but it typically applies to people who have made some commitment to try to follow the Eightfold Path in their life. It doesn't mean they've attained it. It doesn't mean they've achieved it. It doesn't mean they know how to follow the rules. It means that they are committed to inclining their life toward the Eightfold Path. And once I saw it, I had taken a mindful experience. It's more than I both stood up to the same trepidation and, and doing it. I think we found that uh, it was simply a commitment to keep in touch with the complex training that comes to us, with the to try to learn more about the age form of that and try to incline our lives for the eightfold path. There's no word enlightenment in my vocabulary here, and I wouldn't know it if it didn't in the face. <laughs> but I do know when I achieve a little more clarity of mind. And if that's what enlightenment is, you have to get a little bit of it every once in a while, but it only comes through in climbing toward this path. Thank you, Mary. Jonathan. The three things in space that have been referred to that in terms of that specific thing in terms of experience. Um, when I took it, I decided that I could take at least one of them. And I was like, yeah, what the hell? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> And I did it, I love it, and it's wonderful. Um, and actually, I love it where the feedback comes through, because it's one of the stories. Um, the second thing is um, around uh, vegetarianism and veganism. Um, I thought that people would, particularly people in my family, would be very like, oh, crap, I do it all the time. Me? What are you talking about? I'm just locking your nose tonight. People have been just like, you know, it's not going to get us ready, but. My fears are far from the reality. And the third thing is around the alcohol kind of thing that is an alcohol consumption to me. Um, so I've definitely reduced my consumption of alcohol. 
Um, and I say I think about the last and a half ago, and I set up a whole day so um, not all of them go sitting and walking through and working pretty much. And I can pull off the camera, I'm working on the one I just want to have five, I got two five on the end. And as I was watching my cat bowls as the season went like, through the end of the night, I had this just most profound, beautiful experience of emptiness. I was just like a little thought of it. And it was just wonderful. And I do know you don't need to drink alcohol in the top experience. <laughs> yeah, I still did. Um, and so it just allowed me to have sort of a flexible 